Welcome to Zelda's Peaches and Biscuits podcast. I'm Elena Doten, the director of the Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum, and I'm joined with... Maura Martello. I am a Zelda researcher, and I am a docent here at the museum. Welcome. So today we want to talk about Zelda's early dance influences, and also who, we, as, as we head to her high school years and her formative years, we want to explore the people that we think are her uh, inspiration. Like, who is she patting herself, patterning herself after? And one of those is, we believe, Irene Castle. And Irene and Vernon Castle were media superstars in the U.S. in the early 1900s. Uh, he had been apparently a vaudeville actor. He meets her. She was a socialite from New York, I think New Rochelle. And they become this dancing duo sensation Uh, And if you don't know them, we highly recommend that you see the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers uh, film. I think you you mentioned it's their last film. Yes. Yes. And it's the Irene and Vernon Castle story. And she was, um, um, Irene Castles was a consultant on that film. So. I didn't know that. Yeah. I I, I rewatched it a few nights ago and. I think they're love. The Fred and Ginger movies are just lovely. I think. Yeah, and this one, as I, this was one of my favorites uh, growing up as a kid, and I remember it being extremely funny. I haven't watched it in a few years, particularly the beginning. I guess they meet cute, and there's all kinds of yeah. developments within yes. the romance yeah. uh, that are amusing. And I, when I was a kid, I just thought they were hilarious. So the reason that, or the way that we know that the Vernon Castles were an influence on Zelda is. From uh, Rosalind's notes to Sarah Mayfield, or it says from notes to Nancy Milford. And in uh, the notes, she writes that, well, we'll go back to Save Me the Waltz. She's, she's talking about, Rosalind is talking about Save Me the Waltz. And she said that Joan was obviously Clotilde and more quiet and conforming than Zelda and me. And I would say probably the most satisfactory in our parents' eyes. And she goes on to describe that she had a more classic beauty, et cetera, et cetera. And then she talks about Zelda's version of Tildy's lost love and her subsequent marriage is truer than in her story of me as Dixie and Randolph McIntosh. And explain who Randolph McIntosh is in Save Me the Waltz. Uh, Randolph is uh, a a married man or a divorced man. Yeah, uh, and he's dating Dixie, and he is from a different caste yeah. uh, than uh, Dixie. He's poor; he has no money, and he lives. Actually, he has a little girl. Uh, on top of being a divorced mm-hmm. man or a married man, yeah. I've forgotten exactly yeah. which, uh, his little girl lives in the cane breaks in Alabama, which I believe are bamboo breaks uh, mm-hmm. in the yeah. southern section of Alabama. Cane breaks. At first, when I first read that, I thought they were talking about sugar cane, but apparently it is bamboo. Uh, so he is quite good looking, very attractive, uh, and Dixie is mad about him. And they also. As is, as is excuse me, as is Alabama, uh, who, who is, is Zelda. the Zelda character. And, and part of that is that they're organizing these dances. Yes. Yes. And so in looking up what kind of dances they were, these were is Rosalind then refers to Zelda's version uh, uh, and her subsequent marriage is truer than life than mine is Dixie and Randolph McIntosh. There was a boy with whom I was infatuated and with whom I helped in organizing a dancing class for grown-ups uh, during the Irene and Ca- Vernon Castle era, but he was a charming young person of impeccable manners and utmost decency and was not married... <laughs> Far from the undesirable uh, character Zelda produced from her imagination to make the situation more lively. Now, you've done a little research here. Yeah, I did. I was trying to... My, my question was, is we know where how the Vernon Castle method was introduced in Montgomery, and that's by uh, Sam Rosenberg, who later marries Amelia Harper, who becomes Amelia Harper Rosenberg, who's a lifelong friend and really dance teacher of Zelda. Um, And so I was trying to see if Randolph McIntosh was happened to be um, Sam Rosenberg, and it's not. Uh, But Rosalind and a man named Mr. Ralph Sims, um, 
they do these dances. So if you don't know what the Vernon Castles, they would dance in kind of vaudeville shows. They would be the dance act. And later they were hired. So if you went to a nightclub, not like we call today, but, but people would go dressed in evening wear. They would do a dance as part of the entertainment. So there was normally a band, a jazz band, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then they would dance as part of entertainment, and then people would get up and then dance on the floor after them. And so apparently Rosalind and this Mr. Ralph Sims would perform together, and then also Sam Rosenberg and Amelia Harper would then um, perform a dance. And I, I'm just impressed uh, that you found uh, Mr. Ralph Sims. <laughs> yes. Uh, because my whole life, since I first read <laughs> Say Me the Walls, I've been infatuated with the character of Ran- Randolph McIntosh, who's kind of devastating in the book. And then you, uh, and then, uh, you come up with this name, Mr. Ralph Sims. Ralph Randolph. Yeah. Who else could it be? I, and, and also, we know from the clippings, and we'll post some of these as usual, uh, he and Rosalind appear together in quite a number. So there's one at the Exchange Hotel, and this is uh, the Exchange Hotel had the ballroom. We know Scott and Zelda dance there a lot after they meet. Uh, and this says, Dinner Dance at Exchange Hotel Proves Delightful Affair. And then they, they're mentioning people who, uh, it says, Despite the busy rush, for the Christmas season, a number of the smart set pause long enough on Monday evening to attend the dinner dance at the Exchange Hotel. And then they talk about, you know, they list the people at the tables. And it says, at another table, Mr. and Mrs. Simon Gassenheimer, and, and we'll come across that name quite a bit. They're friends of Zelda. And at another table, Miss Rosalind Sayre and Ralph Sims. And it says, the feature of the evening was an exhibition dance given by Sam Rosenberg and Miss Amelia Harper. They dance the Polish Gavotte, uh, which is one of the most graceful of all the ballroom dances, and then the Russian Waltz and the Lilting Foxtrot. Um, and so they were the featured entertainment, and a different clipping, Rosalind and Ralph Sims are. So again, going to this, our, our theory, or our, our idea that Zelda is really, you know, in some ways in Rosalind's shadow, and you don't get any sense of that in the biographies. Um, and that's where I think all of our research has really pointed. Uh, and then, so, so there's, and then we were talking in the last episode, the sisters are going to all these parties, all these dances. Is Zelda jealous or not? And from Save Me the Waltz, it seems that Rosalind probably included her because as Zelda gets older, or as Alabama and Save Me the Waltz, She's performing with That's this right. gentleman. And she's we, even devising the dances. Yes. And so we know it the same from other clippings, and we will cover Amelia, Harper, Rosenberg, and ballet and Zelda's ballet roots in a different podcast. But there's two different kinds of dancing going on, and this is the, the one question that, that I, I don't think has been answered, is why was Zelda... She, we know that she's most likely dancing the Vernon Castle method in the early 19, you know, 1910, 19, up to 1914, 16. And then later she goes back to ballet. And I'm wondering if it is there because there is, I don't know, a rivalry because you have these two dancing pairs. You have um, Sam, Sam Rosenberg, we'll just say Sam and Amelia. And then we have Rosalind and Ralph. And then Sam Rosenberg and Amelia become professional dancers and they they take classes in New York um, and then when they come he we know Sam Rosenberg went to the Vernon Castle School of Dancing and he was also the pupil of Edward J. Curlio I don't know he was a ballet master at the Imperial School in Warsaw and then it says Amelia was a graduate of the Menzeli School of Dancing in New York and then in 1915 uh, Vernon Castle comes to Montgomery, and I don't think we can over-exaggerate the popularity of the, the castles. Oh, yeah. They were media stars. Um, some of, um, some of like, before a movie, you would have these show reels, kind of like instead of previews, and they were featured, you know, doing new dance steps, and we will post there is some footage of them dancing. They... They, they just become absolute media stars. They begin endorsing things. 
as Vernon Castle clothes, Vernon shoes. She becomes, Irene Castle becomes this major style icon, which we'll talk about. But for, for Vernon Castle to come to Montgomery and to visit a former pupil, Sam Rosenberg, is a huge deal. Yeah. yeah, and and so we know that he comes in August of 1915, and it says Vernon Castle honors Montgomery dancers. So I also think it points to how strong of a background they really had in dance here. It wasn't just you know you think people yeah. send their kids to ballet school to you know yeah, take the way ballet. it was uh, when we were we were kind of kids, yeah. 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. Uh, you know, you ha- you would have a good ballet uh, teacher or dance yeah. teacher, but most people went on to something else. Here we have people who are educated in New York returning to Montgomery and teaching uh, students. I mean, these people were graduating from fine schools. Uh, I do have a quote here from Helen Hayes, the actress, Mm -hmm. the stage actress, Helen Hayes, about the castles. And I just wanted to read it. she, t- she, knew, she knew the castle. She worked with them. But she says, My Vernon and his lovely wife, meaning uh, Irene, uh, were the famous castles, a sensation on both sides of the Atlantic. They used to call such stars the toast of two continents, and they certainly were. We're talking what we would call today a superstar. Yeah, they were superstars. Um, and just very quickly, it says, Mr. Sam Rosenberg, the dancing artist who has been in New York throughout the summer attending the Castle School, is meeting with remarkable success. News received here by his friends of the success he has met with. He has shown such marked ability in ballet dancing that Vernon Castle had given him a special dance at which he was awarded a blue ribbon for excellence. He was also chosen from among hundreds as the only male member of a ballet of 20 and was paid a high compliment by Edward uh, Krulio, the great Russian dancer for his work. And kind of skipping ahead into in the 30s when the Fitzgeralds could come back or here in the house, um, Zelda uh, takes classes. I think With most Amalia, people yes. know that the photo that was taken here in the house of her in ballet costume for the dust jacket for Save Me the Waltz. She was studying with Amelia, or at least going to her studio. Uh, We know that from the letters, because they kind of have a falling out, because Zelda wanted to use, I guess... Is it over music? It's over music. (laughs) (laughs) And and then later in the 40s, in one of her final letters to Scott, I think September 40, she says the only people that she sees are Livy Hart, who was one of her childhood friends, and, and we'll talk about her more on another episode, uh, then Amelia, and then Mrs. McKinney. So that's Kate Slaughter McKinney. Um, and so these, so we know that Zelda has this lifelong relationship with Amelia, and they even dance together as young women. Uh, it's, and that's really the question that I've always wondered. Why didn't Zelda... She, never, she clearly never gave up the ballet, and we know that she's still going to... If, if she's only seeing Amelia, it's because she's going to dance classes. Mm-hmm. So why she never became a teacher? Zelda herself. Yes, yeah. that's what I really, really wonder is because the, 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 the trajectory of ballerinas is they have a very short, or even dancers, male dancers, even Broadway dancers, that their career is, has a, a small window. They're like professional athletes. And then after, if you've been on Broadway or you've reached these certain heights, you then become a very respected teacher. Or a choreographer. Choreographer. Maybe. And so I don't know if maybe Zelda didn't become more of a dance teacher because Amelia already was the dance teacher here. Yeah, it's an, that's an interesting question uh, yeah. that I hadn't thought about. Uh, we do know that... Um, Zelda in the 40s in Montgomery uh, was once encouraged to speak about uh, the ballet. Mm. And I think it was at a uh, garden party. And I forget who the, who the friend was who recorded her feelings about Zelda speaking about the ballet, but she thought that Zelda was so brilliant in discussing the dance. Yeah, you know? we'll, we'll find it. I think that may have been a blue stockings. Maybe. Yeah. maybe. Um, and Such ju- a loss, really not to have her remarks. And uh, just one more thing on, on Amelia is she studied the under the Manzelli method of ballet in New York. And ads from, like, the New York Tribune, there was an ad um, 
that it was by personal interview was by appointment for Madame Manzelli. And then in 1915, it says sketches of, of old New York. And in it, it says a new crop of dancing stars, ballet, Greek, and national um, are to scintillate in the theatrical firmament next year. And it says Madame Menzeli, famous instructor of classic ballet, has just graduated her class. When dancers receive the endorsement of Madame Menzeli, it means an engagement at once. Um, so, again, we just want to kind of clarify that Zelda studied dance from a very early age, and the, t- the people that she's dancing here with, that she's learning from, are, are very accomplished dancers. Yeah. And they're studying with some of the best in the country then. It's amazing, And, and really. so that's one of the biggest questions that we have when people come to the museum, because they see we have the cutout of Zelda, and she's in the ballet costume, and they're like, oh, why did she try to start so late? Or who tries to start ballet at, I don't know, 30 she didn't. Um, she she studied here for like, yeah, her this whole is life. Where so many of the biographers have gone wrong with Zelda. I don't think they have the information, but yeah, it's it's just the supposition. And we'll we'll do far more on the ballet. We'll do her early ballet years. Then, of course, in Europe with um, Igorova. The other thing that I wanted to talk about with the going back to the castles is I believe Irene Castle was a major influence on an early Zelda, and I think the castles were the predecessors of the flapper movement. And the fact that that her teachers here were that close to them, knew them, um, I think even strengthens strengthens that argument. Because one of the things I didn't fully realize is that Irene Castle was one of the first women to bob her hair. And it makes national news in 1914. It says, and there was a national co- a column that ran nationally. Um, it says, the Miss Vernon Castle set style in, quote, bobbed hair. And you had an idea about why she may have bobbed it. Originally. Originally. Uh, only from something that I read, I picked up a, something on the, probably just on the internet, that she had had appendicitis, and she decided to cut her hair. Now, I was wondering, with appendicitis, you get a high fever. Often that's one of the symptoms, as well as nausea and mm-hmm. other things. And I'm wondering, in, in the early days, in the 19th century, maybe the early 20th century, when people, women got um, fevers, uh, often their long hair was cut off. Doctors would cut it off so that you could... Yeah. It, that heavy hair, which was hot, uh, it, it it just cooled, supposedly cooled your uh, yeah. your fever a bit. I don't think that worked. They did it to, I know they did it to um, Florence Nightingale. There are photographs yeah. of Florence Nightingale with short hair. She's wearing a kind of a, a little um, lace on her head. But the hair is very short and sticking out from her ears. Uh, and it's because she had uh, brucellosis. Uh, which caused very high fever, and the doctors sh- sheared her hair. That seems so intrusive, though. If you think, like, even in, in Little Women, oh, you're one beauty, your right. long hair. Right. And up until, really, ni- the early 1910s, up until World War One, a woman's hair, to Absolutely. think that a doctor would just cavalier, like, it, it would almost be like, you know, a mark of some kind. Mm-hmm. But... If that's the case, we, we don't know, but she is the first to bob her hair, and it becomes a national sensation. And that led to the question that we haven't yet really worked out or answered is when when does Zelda bob her hair? Yeah, I've been looking at all the photos, <laughs> trying to do a, you know, t- t- detective work. I'm yeah. not as good as detective work as you are. Huh. <laughs> uh, I, because uh, you, you have the book, The Romantic Egoist, which is the compilation of their two... Um, scrapbooks and you see a picture of zelda swimming and she clearly has very long hair but she looks how old do you think she is in that photo and we'll post these again the year is not marked but i'm gonna say 15 or 16 maybe 16 maybe because my question looking at her yearbook photos and the girls in her yearbook photos they all kind of seem to have bobbed hair but i really wondered if it was a faux bob Yes, exactly. You know, it's the long hair where they... they they're they, hiding They're hiding hair. it, and they all have this kind of weird shape to it. We'll, we'll post some of these. If they, if they have a faux bob. Yeah, if mom just refuses to let you get your hair cut. cut. But 
And they all, all of her classmates have it. Yeah. So I'm just, um, I wonder if it's true. a national it's style funny. because st- things come into style and then it takes a little while for it to um, become mainstream. And I think that's really what the, the castles do and when you will post pictures the other thing in the helen hayes book that you mentioned she referred to how skinny yes she was and uh, we think of scott and zelda she was zelda watched her weight kept her weight down which may have been in part because of dance but if you think about the late 1800s the bell epic period what women are wearing they have those corsets you think the original coke bottle very busty little ways and you know, they bustles to make their butt looks big, even bigger. So you get this very curvy, what we would say, figure today. And then Irene Castle comes, and she's quite thin yeah. um, and, and more trim, but she's described as being skinny. Mm-hmm. And that had a, was in part a function of, you know, if you're wealthier, you have more you have more money, you eat more, you're more robust, I guess. Or, or my grandmother used to joke, nice and plump, you know. And then... As we head toward World War One, we forget there were rations, there was some shortage, so that people probably that being thinner kind of connoted less affluence, and I think that changes with Irene Castle. Yeah, and of course it becomes a total uh, fad during the twenties, where women now are the the silhouette of women is changing fantastically. You know, with flattened chests, yeah. flat hips, dropped uh, drop waist, of course. The waist go way down to yeah. uh, the hips. Yeah, um, That's in part why you have to do the Charlestons, because you can't, you can, you can only move, you know, you can't do a, like a high kick because you got that band around your, your hips. Uh, so in, in December of 1914, there was a column that ran nationally, and it's by Margaret Mason, uh, writing for the United Press, and she describes uh, her bobbing her hair. It says, Miss Vernon Castle isn't content to have Miss America follow her in her dance steps. She also wants her to follow her fashionable lead. Believe me, Miss America is, is nothing loath to try. She follows not blindly, but with both eyes well open to all the latest little sartorial tricks displayed by this high price uh, doer. I should say high priestess. Um, and then it goes on to describe, you, you bob the hair, and it says, the real castle way is to brush the mass of bobbed hair straight back from the forehead with just a straggling lock falling down between the eyes for all the world like the well-known little girl of varied moods with a curl in the middle curl. of her forehead. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is something, I, I know I always go back to my grandmother, but she lived here, mm-hmm. and and it's a family joke and poem because there once was a little girl who had a curl in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. Right. And I got this poem a lot as a kid, like, mm, you Did know. Did you have a spit curl? <laughs> no, but if you, if I was naughty or something, I would get this, do you have a curl in the middle of your forehead? <laughs> you know? And so when I saw this, it made me laugh because this was and kind of remains a saying here in Montgomery. And we also, there's a photo, which a lot of uh, Zelda fans will know. It's her at the piano. <laughs> and um, some people think that, that that photo, because it's often cropped, it's just her at the piano, and they assume it's at home, and it's not. It was some kind of play or something they're yeah. performing whether it was at school i have no yeah, idea yeah and there's there's women uh in the photo and they all have this very obvious weird curl <laughs> almost pasted on their forehead on their forehead yeah. and my grandmother told me that when she was young and they would do this they would use soap mm-hmm. to make that that to make it sticky s- yeah and stiff so it would like a hair gel <laughs> but that the soap would somehow bleach their hair So we'll post the photo, but you'll see it's kind of a silly-looking curl. Yeah, if you look at Clara Bow films, and I'm a huge Clara Bow fan, uh, the professional uh, hairdressers of Hollywood, of course, made those spit curls look absolutely gorgeous gorgeous. on a gorgeous woman. You know, but of course we're talking about adolescence in Montgomery (laughs) Montgomery. with soap. (laughs) I mean, it's like if you can. Well, you'll see the picture, and once you see it, you're like, yeah. Um, She is. So, in, it goes on. This is a bit too barefaced, however, for most brows 
and sew a confession of fillet of pearls, a narrow ribbon of gold band, either plain or with a jewel drop or medallion, uh, in the center is worn around the head just above the eyebrows. So we're beginning to see so it's, it's the bob with some kind of headband. So we're talking about the predecessor of the flapper headband. Yeah. And at our galas, uh, not that I've been to a gala here mm. yet at the museum, often, uh, am I wrong, that guests, uh, the female guests show up with these these. Oh, yeah, headbands? absolutely. Yeah, because it's a 20s party. People yeah. try, yeah. And we do have uh, here Zelda's uh, headband that she made for herself. And we've sold out, and we'll probably make some more. There's a replica that she made. It's a, a black ribbon, and it has a single white feather, uh, and then there are rhinestones. Well, I'll post the picture, too, and it has a little red jewel. And we had someone make replicas, and we'll probably do it again. Um, so, again, I just think that the, the one thing that's kind of missing is who were Zelda's idols? Who did she look up to? And I think one of the most popular women uh, in America is Irene Castle. And... I think this picture looks like uh, May Seal West, one of, of Zelda's closest friends. You have um, is Eleanor Browder, Mary Seal West, Livy Hart, and there's a picture of them from high school, and it's just their shoulders up. There's a, yes. the line of girls, and I think Mary Seal West looked, and I'll post the pictures you can see, really looks like Irene Castle. The other thing about the castle... Well, they were probably emulating her. They probably yes. bought the magazines, you know, yeah. the popular magazines at the time. And also the castles, again, they you would see their movie shorts on how to perform a dance before a movie. And then even in the Montgomery Advertiser, there would be a full page, like an ad or story, on how to uh, perform certain dances. I think I printed one out. It's the... Um, I don't know, a polka or whatnot. So you're having full-page ads on how to teach. You you can then see it at the movie. We have, obviously, Rosalind's helping teach this method. Um, the uh, Harper Rosenbergs are. And then they also, it's kind of the Martha Stewart thing. You have a blog post, you then put it in the magazine, and then you repackage it as a book, and this is exactly what they did. So the, the Vernon Castle's, they publish a book called Modern Dancing. And in it, there are two things that I thought were very interesting, and I think th they reminded me of Zelda, and it probably was an influence on her. And it says, Modern Dances as Fashion Reformers. And it goes on to, it says, In the world of fashion, where there is no appeal from the decree of the great designers, the modern dance has come boldly to the front and demanded in one's sensible styles. On looking back a few seasons to the clothing worn by women and girls, you will recall long, cruel corsets and garters that trust them like fowls for the roasting. You will remember, too, the tight snakiness of the hobble skirts and the hats that were shaped like peach baskets. So if you, you think, like the Belle Epic, huge corsets, very constraining, those tight hobble skirts, and then you have, we're talking that big picture hat, just not conducive for dancing. And so this is when you begin to see the shift um, for looser clothes becoming less constrained. You begin to see new kinds of undergarments is not just the corset. Um, and I think this is in large part brought on by Irene Castle. And if you think Zelda, fat, in terms of her fashion, she was always very sporty. She almost mm -hmm. had golf clothes on. Yes. We don't see her... And these drapes, silks, or frilly chiffons. It's, it's, both she and Scott were just very sporty. Um, and I'll, I'll post some of the uh, images from the modern dancing book. Um, and it also says, Dancing has had its influence upon the materials that have come into vogue. It is, uh, it is necessary to have one's frock soft and light. A stiff, heavy material looks awkward, uh, awkward and makes harsh lines about the figure and the charming measures of the dance. In consequence, there has arisen a tremendous demand for soft crepe de chine, chiffons, velvets, delicate crepes, and the softest and most supple of taffetas, which are at the moment the most fashionable of all. So, and the other one, it says, um, 
It says big hats are unpleasant to dance in. So we're seeing women not have the big hat. We're, we're seeing the cropped hair. The, the reason that she gives for having a bob is that it's easier to dance in. Mm-hmm. And if you think of this big Gibson girl hair, I mean, that hair just piled on. You can't dance in that. Yeah, and it can also you, tumble down. Yes, you can't breathe. You have to sit in corsets. I just had a thought. How much did I don't know that Isadora Duncan was a household word in uh, this era, but, you know, she also advocated for loose loose clothing. She uh, was more... I, I mean, well, she was well, a well, modern dancer, of course. We'll talk about that, but I've done quite a bit of research on Isadora Duncan and the stories that appeared here in Montgomery. She was well-known, and she wore these this kind of flowing Greek-like drapery, yes. which was somewhat scandalous because it it, it verged on nudity. And in fact, there was a column, and we'll get to it, there's a difference between being nude and naked, which in the South, you know, naked, if you say someone's (laughs) naked, it's different from being naked. Um, And and Spelled what? N-E-K-K-I-D? Naked, yeah. And so they're naked. Um, But you see that, and, and also I think people don't, no, in terms of ballet, you have the fawn coming out, the, um, oh, yeah. which looks really awkward today, but was just absolutely scandalous at Afternoon the time. Afternoon of a fa- uh, fawn? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Nijinsky. Nijinsky, yeah. and he's wearing you know, these tight clothes. And they do poses almost like Greek urns and whatnot. It's very stilted. But at the time, it was just incredibly yeah. scandalous because it was considered have, erotic. I actually have seen Afternoon of a, uh, of a Fawn yeah. at uh, City Ballet. I don't yeah. think City Ballet is, uh, yeah. I think it's been disbanded, uh, sadly, yeah. uh, he, where um, the Nijinsky character, the Fawn, mm. jumps through a window. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing ballet. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Stravinsky's music. Yes. Um, so everything's changing, really. So they're in this great flux. So you're, you're seeing, and I, I think the castles are really the media figures that are bringing this change on. The other is there's this very short uh, chapter in the book. It goes, Dancing as a Beautifier. And in essence, she's talking about how... How can a woman keep her figure? And it says, a clever woman, Mr. Castle, and I know, has summed up the evils of a woman's life in the declaration that, quote, one gray hair is a tragedy, 15 extra pounds is a heartbreak, and a double chin is the end of life solutions. So we dye the gray hair and dye it away the 15 pounds and tie up our chins till no one grows or two grew before. Um, and she says, every night and every morning, with the faith and hope of re- religious zealots, thousands of women bob up and down and squat and rise and bow and bend and wiggle their heads and rub their necks and go through all the rites of the liturgy of beauty, that is, they, that is, if they don't dance. The woman who dances does not need other beauty aids. Beauty will seek her. This is not a theory but a fact. For when a woman is dancing, she is happily unconscious and therefore easily carrying out all the exercises taught by beauty experts. So if you consider, like, in the 80s, jazzercise, and you can still, like, dance with dancing, and this, all these workout videos basically try to make working out fun via dancing. And it seems that the Vernon Castles were the first to really advoc- advocate that as well. Um, and so you can see how a young Zelda... We know that she's eating the tomato sandwiches to keep her weight down and that she's she's going out all the time. Her senior year, I don't know how she graduated, just yeah. going through the clippings. Uh, and then after graduating, and like from 18 to 19, before she and Scott marry, it's just amazing how, how often she's out. And but if you think, if you're dancing every night, It would keep you slimmer. Absolutely. And then the other, which we haven't gone over, is her love of swimming. I think swimming and dance were for her, her exercise or her recreation. Yeah, and it was for a lifetime. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I do think she had Olympic... uh, Olympic talent in the in the swimming department for that time probably because she was even voted the best swimmer of her class and it I think connotes even among the boys she must have been uh, a very strong swimmer Mm -hmm. we'll we'll talk about it because there's another female figure um Annette Kellerman who is a very is, is I think comparable somewhat with the the castles in that 
she's swimming. It's who, oh, I've gone blank. Um, she did all the great swimming movies in the 40s. Oh, uh, Esther Williams. E- Esther Williams. She was the inspir- And Esther Williams does her story, Annette Kellerman. Annette Kellerman was the first woman to appear nude on screen. And it was the first million-dollar movie in cost. And the first million-dollar movie in box office is Annette Kellerman, this Australian swimmer, who also does one of these help books. Um, we haven't really gotten to that yet, but there's quite a number. I think we, One of my uh, growing... Um, ideas of Zelda is that a lot of what of what she learned from were these help books. So the Vernon Castles have the modern dancing book. Annette Kellerman has the How to Swim book. That that this is, you know, we look at YouTube videos today. And I think a lot of um, Zelda's early ideas and training come from these books. But these are also again very prominent women. Uh, and Annette Kellerman talks quite a bit about how swimming is the best way to keep your health but also develop a really strong figure yeah yeah and it's not this dainty figure both dance and swimming like you said before ballerinas are exceptional athletes yeah. they're not these tiny little things they're, yeah it's all lighting and and well they're pure muscle once they get yeah. on stage i mean yeah. it's all um and so i think that's what you're seeing with um Irene Castle and the remark that she was skinny, that there's this new trimness, this new... um, Women are able to do more physically. They're beginning to play golf. That's part of the flapper movement is they're they're no longer in these corsets where they just can only sit and be pretty and have huge hats. (laughs) Uh, Instead, the flapper flapper dress kind of liberates women to be able to physically to play golf. Uh, I know women rode, but it's still not, not quite the same. The other innovation that I think probably had a major influence, not nationally, but also um, here in Alabama, is that the music director that the castle has was a man named James Reese Europe, or Jim Europe, who was an African-American band leader, early ragtime and early jazz band leader, uh, who composed quite a bit of music for them and traveled with them, and so, in a way, the castles introduce jazz to the, both Europe, because they're huge in Europe first. I think they make it in Europe first and then come back to America. Um, she was American, and Vernon Castle was English. So, um, But the fact that they help introduce and popularize jazz, um, first ragtime and then jazz, in, into dance is, I don't think, can be understated, I mean overstated, rather, that we know Scott coins the jazz age, but jazz is still percolating when they are teens and doesn't really reach its full public apex till the 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And we will post some of the music. I, I found a couple um, of, of songs. For example, he did, the, and they, they published these as records. So again, the castles were just a, a huge marketing couple. They're marketing shoes, they're marketing clothing, they're marketing hair care, makeup products, just for both men and women. And then they also, um, their band leader is some of these early uh, records. So they have like the castle combination waltz, um, the castle uh, uh, humoresque, I won't read them all, but the, the castle perfect foxtrot. Uh, and then the one that I kind of liked was the Castle Machich Brazilian. It's kind of a, they modified what we now know is kind of ballroom dancing. They popularized a lot of these steps. The other, the last thing in the back of the book, and I think you may have the square. It's kind of the do's and don'ts uh, of and the don'ts. of the. I have it here someplace. Yeah, if you'll read, so so at the end of their book. They kind of have these do's and don'ts on what good dancing is, and they made they made me laugh. Uh, these are the castle house suggestions for correct dancing. Do not w- wiggle the shoulders. Do not shake the hips. Do not twist the body. Do not flounce the elbows. Do not pump the arms. Do not hop. Glide instead. Avoid low, fantastic, and acrobatic dips. So basically, we're talking uh, a more sophisticated style of dancing. Yeah, and then chic. at the bottom, read yes. which which dances they are kind of averse yeah, to. They're, they're telling you to drop the turkey trot, the grizzly bear, the bunny hug, 
These dances are ugly, ungraceful, and out of fashion. So I, I looked up what the bunny hug was, and it looks like a, a drunken dance. And essentially, the girl has her arms around the guy's neck, but they're, it's like, it made me laugh because of social distancing. And then the guy has his, his hands on basically her waist or hips, but their bodies are as far apart as they can be. And it just looks like they're hanging on each other. And it, it is, not, but it, it looked funny. It looked like, like a drunken, how if you were both drunk and you had to hold on to each other and then kind of move around, that's what the bunny hug looked like. And it had its own sheet music. I'll, I'll, there's, a, I'll, there's some YouTube videos on what it looks like. There is a movie that I do recommend people, and you don't have to go to YouTube to see it. You can buy it on DVD. It's uh, available on Amazon. It's a movie from the 1950s called The Actress. It's based on a Ruth Gordon play. And in it, it's about um, Ruth Gordon, who was a famous actress. She won an Oscar for Rosemary's Baby very late in life. But she was a young actress uh, who grew up in uh, Massachusetts, very poor in Massachusetts. Uh, And in the film... Uh, she wants to become an actress, and she falls in love with an actress named uh, Hazel Dawn, who also was a dancer and a violinist. Uh, the film opens with Hazel Dawn, who's also called the Pink Lady because that was her major hit show. This is around ni- between 1910 and 1915. But there's a scene in the movie which stars uh, Jean, uh, Jean Simmons, and she dances with... Uh, Oh my gosh, the, the name of the actor is going out of, uh, out of my brain at the moment. Uh, Anthony Perkins, a very young Anthony Perkins, who most people know from the movie Psycho, in which they dance these dances, yeah. and they are horribly awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, of course, we're, you know, yeah. we, we, can't, we can't visualize well, well, it yeah, here. Well, but it's very awkward and very strange looking. The other one is the grizzly bear, where you do your hands up in the air like you're going Hur, and growling and making the claws, and then you kind of, you, you, it's kind of like if you weren't allowed to touch each other and had chaperones. These dances look like either they're silly, which were probably meant to irritate, you know, the shop, which it looks funny. And even when you see the castles, the turkey trot looked kind of fun but then there's all these deep knee bends and you're like if yeah. you're if you're having a long or if you're having these late night dancing i wouldn't want to be doing all these weird knee bends and stuff um some of the castles dances i mean still they 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 really popularized uh or kind of revitalized the waltz um we know they do the, the fox trot, which is a very easy dance. I think most of the music that Scott and Zelda would have danced to, and we'll, we have some of Zelda's records here at the museum, but they were all fox trots, and fox trot's an easy dance to, I think, perform. And then you like the turkey trot, they add this kind of wiggle in cause I get, and stick your rear end out. I guess that's meant to be the turkey's tail. I don't know. Maybe. But yeah. I think the what the what. But what they're advocating against is the first was do not wriggle the shoulders and you think the shimmy is very soon after this. Cause you, Scott was fascinated by the shimmy and even uh, name checks Gilda Gray is uh, as having attended Gatsby's party and she is credited with being the originator of the shimmy. If you know the shimmy is where you, shim- you, you shake your shoulders, very sexy. And it says, do not shake the hips. And you're like, in what world are you not shaking your hips? Um, and I think you were talking about um, how Zelda would raise her arms so that they noticed that she would. Yeah, uh, there, there's a story uh, that the, uh, that the uh, British writer, uh, Rebecca West, uh, when she first met Zelda, uh, Zelda was standing uh, with her back towards uh, West, and she was talking, and I guess she was very animated, and she raised her hands, and (laughs) and Rebecca West told Nancy Milford, I thought F. Scott Fitzgerald would have married uh, Irene Castle rather than (laughs) Zelda. I guess, but, you know, Zelda was still very young. Oh, well, I just think that the the castle method... I mean, it's kind of what you see on Dancing with the Stars today. They've kind of made it a little more sexy. But I think it's just the castles are, are kind of Rosalind said. Even Rosalind said in, in, in her notes is this is what we were teaching older married couples. And so a young teen might learn these. 
But I'm sorry, the bunny hug is just so much more fun and silly and ridiculous than doing a, you know, whatever, a, a proper waltz, you know. And, and I, I, I do think, though, that the castles were a major influence. The other thing is their story ends somewhat tragically, is that he enlists in World War I um, with, I guess, what would now be the RAF, the, the Royal Air Force. I don't think it was the Air Force then. And he, after the war, dies in a flight accident, I believe, in Texas. Yeah. And so he um, dies, and she goes on to remarry. But I don't think she ever fully keeps the, the fame. The other thing in looking at their images, and there's a color-tinted image of them on the cover of the book, is that he's blonde, hair sl- kind of slicked back, and you think that they really heading into the 20s kind of are the standard for, for beauty, both male and, and female, and that when you see the cover of This Side of Paradise, it really looks like Scott and Zelda, even though they weren't you know, major figures yet. And then, of course, Beautiful and Damned was based on them. But their predecessor is, is in fact, Vernon Castles had that very elegant look, the slick back blonde hair. Um, so I think that he was as equally influential on, on men's fashion or men's style as she seems to have been, and that they were really the predecessors of what was to become the flapper age. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, any last thoughts on the the castles or? Well, what can we say? Uh, I think it's worth checking them out. Um, yeah, we will. If you want to see the, I watched the Fred Astaire. I think in an earlier podcast, I said Fred Astaire was one of their greatest protégés. I looked it up, and I don't know that he specifically studied directly under them. Um, there was some varying... Yeah, I, I, he would have had to have been an influence because, as you probably hmm. know, you know, he also came from a dance team. His, yeah. his dance partner was his sister Adele. Yeah. Uh, she went on to marry a yeah. big wig in, in, in England, I think, and yeah. became a Viscountress or something. Yeah, and I think they started in vaudeville. I think... I, I read two different things that he did, but seeing that Irene Castle was... Um, one of the producers and one of the consultants on the movie, which he and, and Ginger Rogers do, is I think his style, you watch it and he, you forget how beautiful and graceful the dancers they were. And I think also Fred Astaire really helped bring tap dance to the wider American audience as well. We know tap dance begins really... Um, in the South, African Americans, you think the Nicholas Brothers are probably two of the greatest tap, tap dancers. If you don't know them, we'll have a lot on the show pages this week. I actually knew Harold Nicholas. Did you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. I have an aut- autographed uh, photo of Harold and his brother Fayard yeah. in my uh, in my hallway. Yeah. Uh, Harold always uh, talked about Fred Astaire, yeah. how Fred Astaire was an influence on him yeah. because he was very. Uh, Harold uh, was quite quite a bit uh, younger than uh, Fred Astaire. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, they are probably the premier uh, tap dancers yeah, uh, they're, of, the, of the 20th century. They, um, and they were hugely influential. If you see, I've forgotten, it's the, it's the film and Cab Calloway. Is Stormy the, Weather. Stormy Weather. Yeah. That sequence is considered one of the best dance pieces ever. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the influence that they had. I mean, from James Brown to Prince, you know, where they do the the, the dance splits. Splits, yeah. And even, um, I would say, even uh, I think Fosse got a lot from from them as well. I, yeah, I think they Fosse had tremendous influence. I mean, they're still influential. And so, and there is um, some footage with Fred Astaire dancing with them. But they, because they were... Uh, also Gene Kelly. They Gene did Kelly. Gene Kelly. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that we kind of can draw all those roots back to the castles. Uh, one other last thing is when I was watching, I, I rewatched some Fred and Ginger movies when you see like the gay divorcee and um, Shall We Dance. You, you kind of see you have the castles and then you... 
Scott and Zelda really were the, the, the jazz age couple. That They really set that beauty standard. And you can see how much of an influence their look. Because Fred Astaire, I think, kind of, you know, the, the hair, blonde, slight. You In some, watching him, you could almost see kind of, not like look like Scott, but you could see the yeah, influence kind of there. Yeah, quality. Yes. Uh, and, and, of course, the... the, the Particularly, I think it's the gay divorcee, and they have the scene where they're under the decks, and he's with basically the black shipmen who are singing, and it introduces jazz. So he's he's I think playing a ballet. He's playing a ballet dance. His ballet is so terrible. I think he's playing Petrov anyway. And so you can see that this is how they're introducing jazz, but this is in the late '30s, so that you see the influence that of 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 the flapper era still in the early films all the way up until the 40s and that that their 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 looks their style of beauty is still i yes, think very slender uh very chic yeah yeah but you i, I just think so what you, did they say about scott and zelda that they always look like they st- stepped out of a band box yes. you know there's yeah. this kind of cleanliness about them and of course the blonde yeah. you know looks because she was always known for being quite tidy, and I think yes. he was always impeccably dressed as well. But watching it, watching those films, you still see how heavy of an influence is still there. Yeah. yeah. So we, um, if you want, those are on I think HBO Max. If you have HBO, I don't know if they're on Amazon, but we'll we'll post links. Um, and again, uh, we've gotten a few questions. We'll probably do an episode where we just answer random questions. Might be fun because we have different ones coming in. But if you have questions, please feel free to email us. You can go to thefitzgeraldmuseum.org and use our contact page. Also, uh, join our Facebook group, the Peaches Zelda's Peaches and Biscuits group. We normally post there like a day or so before uh, everything goes out on the regular Facebook but I uh, hope you all are well as we enter this fall season, and hopefully we'll all be free from COVID soon. <laughs> uh, Till next time, bye. Bye.